James Grant, founder, editor, and publisher of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. It is so great to welcome you to the show. I am so honored to have you on. Jim, welcome. Well, thank you, Julia. It is awfully nice to be here. Well, it's really nice to have you. And I did tweet out earlier that you're coming on and some folks did submit uh, a number of questions that we'll certainly get to in this hour. And well, what, a, what about the answers, Julia? Do they? Well, you'll have the answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there people are obviously excited to have you on. And uh, I know I certainly am. And okay. I was hoping maybe we could start with you know, maybe a bit of the big picture. That's where I generally like to start with my guests is more of like the big macro picture. And I think for you as someone who um, you, you write a lot about this and um, you understand history is maybe more of the context of how we got to where we are today, the events that led us here. Oh, well, uh, here being uh, this pickle. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not such a bad pickle on the I suppose, in the scheme of things, I'm, um, you know, we all get up in the morning and most of us go to work and it's a productive economy and uh, people are by and large healthier than they've ever been, better fed, et cetera, et cetera. But in the context of where we might be, I think there are some gaps and some regrets. And my particular area of uh, concern is uh, is the uh, is the monetary realm that is the uh, 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 the nature of money of which we all want more most of us <laughs> um, uh, the nature of uh, of, uh, of uh, well the um, uh, the standard uh, uh, policy procedures respecting money and the intersection between money and debt another area of interest. And uh, I think what uh, uh, what distinguishes the present moment is the kind of free-form nature of both our money and our approach to indebtedness. Um, over the course of uh, generations and uh, certainly of decades and generations, um, things have become rather loosey-goosey. You know, um, the dollar is a thing that um, uh, no one actually is able to define. Uh, it once upon a time was a thing uh, very concretely defined. It was uh, defined as a weight or a measure. That's how the Constitution regards the dollar. And that was uh, how we all thought of it until fairly recently in the scheme of things. And um, uh, again, what what I think is the is the biggest uh, change in the sweep of our financial history is the uh, is the reconception recon of the dollar as a thing defined to a thing that uh, is kind of you know, kind of floats a little bit and uh, uh, is not so much a is a thing as a as a as a notion you know it's a, um, and I suppose that the moving away from the dollar as a tangible item defined in law as a weight of a, say, precious metal, that strikes, I think, many people as anachronistic. We're so comfortable, most of us, with dealing with uh, software and with um, uh, with intangible things of all kinds uh, that we don't think, most of us, long, hard, or critically about the transformation of the dollar from this thing to something. Uh, that can be uh, and is uh, more or less materialized out of the thinnest of thin air. So that that to me is the uh, is the uh, the kind of the fifty thousand, or I should say, the balloon height. There you go. <laughs> pers pers perspective on uh, our monetary matters, you know, uh, uh, and 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 the change uh, is profound, but it is now becoming rather a distant historical event. The uh, what was the the gold standard um, uh, was in place in all of its simplicity and elegance, and I might say beauty. Um, uh, to be sure, with its fair share of the of the drawbacks that are part and parcel of any human institution, but the, the gold standard in its purity was in place from, we'll call it the 1880s and the form that was best known until uh, about 1914. And then it became 
uh, kind, of, kind of watered down after World War I and then watered down further with uh, the Bretton Woods regime in 1944 until 1971. So uh, uh, it has this, this change from tangibility to intangibility, from a thing to a concept. Uh, this is, uh, is getting to be rather second nature to most of us. We have no, really no social memory of anything preceding it. Um, so that's my, that is my rather protracted speech on how we got to where we are. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of, um, interesting things within that, that I would love to like, just explore. And like, I, I took a bunch of notes and just like this idea that we have no, uh, social memory of anything preceding it that you point out and like how, um, it's evolved from tangibility to this intangibility. And, you know, you also mentioned that it's a thing that no one actually is really able to define like when you think about it, like how how do you define it or maybe how what's the maybe more idealized way of defining it the well dollar, dollar is the dollar is a, is a unit of monetary value that uh, owes its value uh, to social consent to habit and in a tangible way to the uh, ability of anyone to pay his or her taxes with it or to transact with it. The dollar is, you know, nobody, even uh, no one so so critical as I am of current monetary arrangement would would not bother to stoop and pick up a $5 bill as it came wafting down the street, right? And so to that extent, this is a pretty fine system. In fact, when you think of it, it is, it is quite a uh, an achievement that the uh, powers that be have... Um, have presided over a worldwide consent of value in this green piece of paper that has uh, uh, this uncollateralized uh, that is often as not unseen, and uh, you know it's 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 uh, it's no small feat. However, uh, that uh, uh, that description, that characterization of the dollar, also I think. Uh, begins to speak to its weakness, in particular, its weakness as a uh, as a source of uh, facilitating um, excesses in our uh, collective uh, financial and fiscal lives uh, that I think we have not fully uh, recognized, and whose uh, whose downside, or I should say, the downside of which. Um, has still not been uh, fully felt. So the uh, uh, this uh, extraordinary levitation in the sum total of American public debt that's been going on uh, for many years, but certainly uh, in a most alarming rate of rise since uh, the pandemic came in 2020. All this is is made possible uh, by a dollar bill that can be and has been, as I say, conjured. As a magician, Mike, so you know the Federal Reserve says, "Let there be light," or "Let, let there be dough," and it taps a few keys on its computer, and lo and behold, this this uh, these claims, this, this purchasing power, this um, this representation of wealth comes into being and infuses the the bank accounts of the citizens, and everyone feels richer and spends as if he and her were richer, which to a degree. We all have been made. Um, I think the the wealth is a little bit illusory, but still, all the the stimmies and all this money that came to existence in 2020 and 21, all this it would have been impossible under a regime of uh, of a, of, a, of a collateralized what we call convertible currency. Convertible currency work that you uh, uh, you could uh, present your uh, dollar bills to the treasury. And Treasury would be obliged to turn over to you the equivalent in the defined underlying collateral, uh, principally gold, sometimes gold and silver, sometimes mostly silver. Uh, but with, if that had been in place, uh, this great uh, experiment in uh, in public health, you know, the uh, lockdowns, none of this would have been feasible. 
So either you are in favor of it or you're not, but that, but, but the exit, but the transformation of the nature of our money um, has been at the heart of uh, so much of what has happened in the past uh, several generations. Jim, I have to say, like, this is fascinating. And um, I'm just delighted to have you on to have this conversation. I'm taking so many notes and I, and I have even more, more follow-ons because this is just incredible. Um, you just mentioned um, a couple of things here uh, that without like that underlying collateral, like without, I mean, if, they, if there were gold and silver as collateral, I suppose, um, like the lockdowns that we saw, the shutdowns, that would not have been feasible. Explain that to me, because it, it sounds to me like all of the stimmies and the money, it was like illusory, like people felt like they were richer. They had all this excess, like help me. Can you help me understand um, your point there? I'll try. Um, let's go back to the um, uh, the origins of the great bulge in the public debt. It goes back to the 1960s. Um, uh, the dollar was then uh, defined uh, as one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold, thirty-five dollars to the ounce, and uh, Americans were not allowed to own it then. Uh, but foreign governments and their central banks uh, could indeed exchange their unwanted dollars that might have accumulated um, through a trade deficit, for example. They were, its governments were allowed to exchange those unwanted dollars for gold at that rate, at thirty-five dollars the ounce. So the, the United States had only so much gold. Uh, there were so many dollars in the hands of foreigners that the, 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 the risk of a foreign run on the bank, so to speak, the risk that the, uh, uh, that the government of France or of Germany or of Japan would come and say, um, uh, we have been watching uh, the increase in the national debt. And we are a little uneasy. So would you kindly, here are the dollars, you kindly empty Fort Knox just a little bit. And and that dynamic did in, did in fact occur uh, throughout the 60s. Uh, and people began to worry about it. And the United States developed ways of kind of working around it. Uh, there was a, a push to kind of artificially suppress the uh, the value of gold as it was traded in free markets overseas to make it look as if there was not a run on the bank of the United States. However, um, uh, the existence of the convertible, of the privilege of conversion uh, checked the amount of debt that the U.S. could issue, amount of dollars it could emit. And if you look at a long graph of the, uh, of the of American sovereign fiscal health, you will find that uh, the accumulate that the um, uh, that the deficit was not so problematic, nor the debt uh, uh, did it grow so fast in the fifties and the sixties. It it was you know there's still a considerable amount from World War II, but there was nothing like the events of recent years, especially since, okay, so let's fast forward. That was how it then worked. There was a check on the ability of the United States to borrow. It was held to account by the ability of uh, foreigners to uh, present their dollars if they didn't want them to uh, uh, exchange for gold. So fast forward to the present day. So uh, uh, in barges, the uh, the coronavirus um, didn't know what was going to happen. People were properly frightened. Uh, so the government orders a lockdown, and the Fed uh, rolls into action and says, "We are going to uh, uh, to buy uh, treasury bonds, corporate bonds. We are going to initiate uh, policies to extend credit through other means. We are going to flood." the American system with dollar bills to forestall uh, an economic crisis that would compound uh, the fright and the tragedy of this pandemic, which is what they did. And the, dollar, and the, the government borrowed enormous amounts of money to finance the uh, various stimulus programs and to, and to compensate for the fact that uh, the government by fiat had ordered basically the shutting down of economic activity. 
So imagine that, you know, let's, for simplicity's sake, imagine the United States alone had been visited by this bug. And uh, the, so the, 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 it would have been impossible uh, to run up five or eight trillion dollars worth of debt all of a sudden, or for the Fed to expand its balance sheet from what is it, four billion, four trillion to eight trillion, or for M2 money supply broadly defined to grow at a forty percent rate of one over over forty percent by two over two years, and figures are somewhat fuzzy because they're still so extraordinary. But none of the truly astonishing. Uh, uh, ex, you know, um, uh, policies of debt accumulation and 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 credit creation that we employed in these two years would have been feasible because of the constraint, the systemic or the systematic constraints built into a system of gold collateralized money. So th this of course, becomes rather a political question. What would you have done? Would you rather have gone on with life and and uh, and uh, ensured? Anyway, I'm not going to define this in political terms. There's no need. Everyone can do it for himself or herself. But um, I think that is perhaps at least one attempt at answering that question. Yeah. You also pointed out um, that the excesses of our in our collective financial and fiscal lives have not been fully recognized or, or fully yet fully felt yet. Can you, um, explain your thinking there? Um, I don't know if you have anything that you're kind of thinking about or anticipating as it relates to that, but I thought that was interesting. And I want to explore that a little bit further too. this notion that we haven't fully felt yeah. all of the consequences there. Well, there's a, there's a word that you hear batted around regarding the public debt, and that word is unsustainable. And it's kind of a, you know, a inoffensive, anodyne, safe word. Everyone can agree it's unsustainable because um, if a debt is growing faster than the means with which to service and repay it, then it's by definition not sustainable, right? But even, it's even not sustainable if the point of crisis is 500 years in the future. Um, so uh, the, the rate of growth in debt is far outstripping uh, the rate of growth in the means uh, to service it now. Uh, uh, so I am safe in saying that at some point there will be some comeuppance. So people will say, my goodness, um, uh, at uh, 31 trillion in uh, the debt was worrying at uh, 35. We'll now say it is more concerning. We have uh, uh, an interest burden that was formerly like 1% of GDP, and now it's 3 or 4 or 5% rising, we'll say, hypothetically. And uh, people no longer wanting to hold uh, the Treasury's uh, promises to pay will sell them. And... Uh, and with the proceeds, they will buy things to protect themselves against rising prices because um, uh, there will be uh, um, uh, an inflationary event attendant upon a crisis of confidence in the credit worthiness of the United States Treasury. That's, that is the scenario that I am spinning for the very long term. Now, in fairness to uh, the critics of this this particular line of thinking, they might say, well, do you recall, Jim, in 1981, when President Ronald Reagan got on national television, he said, uh, Reagan said that, uh, did the, I'm going to paraphrase the Gipper now, he said that the public debt had just topped $1 trillion. $1 trillion. He said, if, if you wanted... Um, a sign, a portent about the risk we face as a, as a nation in our runaway public spending and in uh, our oversized government. This is it. That was one trillion. Okay. <laughs> it took us from 1789 to 1981 to get to one trillion. From 1981 to 2023, we have achieved one trillion to 31 trillion. So, again, obviously, 
the arc of increase is unsustainable. Now, I began worrying about this, I think, when I was two or three years old. That would be 1949. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, uh, um, I guess Warren Buffett said that a uh, lot that the things that people worry about reveal more about themselves than they do about the nature of the objective risk. I think he said that. I wish he hadn't said that because it's a little too close to home. Wait, what do you, wait, what, sorry, what do you mean? What is, what does he mean by that? Well, he means that, um, uh, uh, that when you say uh, that the, uh, the Fed is going to uh, carry us all into the poorhouse, uh, through its reckless, uh, slavish following of its unscientific, unhelpful, and mostly misleading mathematical models, um, uh, that tells more about your propensity to worry than it does about the realistic risk of actually going to the poorhouse. Mm -hmm. That's what he would say. So Warren Buffett is a big one for not worrying about things like that. And... Most people have made a very good way in life by not worrying about things like that, right? You walk down the street, you see 15 or 20 um, normal, prosperous, uh, friendly looking Americans walk by. Not many of those 20 or so uh, spends a lot of time thinking about the, uh, the uh, rate of increase in the public debt or the propensity of the Fed to accommodate that debt with newly printed dollar bills. However, um, I would say to Mr. Buffett, I suppose he's a fan of your show, as so many of us are, Julia, that um, uh, there comes a time for everything. And uh, this perhaps is the time to be thinking more seriously about uh, whether the right. bland, blandly unsustainable state of our public finances might not be, might not be a more immediate risk than uh, we have been led to believe. Right. But like at the same time, so I'm, I'm 34 and I'm, I'm looking at the U.S. debt clock right now on my screen, uh, well north of 31 trillion for uh, U.S. national debt. Well, um, I, was, I, I mentioned 31 trillion only when we started talking. Oh, totally. Oh, we are <laughs> racking up. We're still going higher as we're talking. Um, but even like if you just look at, I like this website too, but like debt per Isn't citizen yeah. is north of 94,000, debt per taxpayer, 246,000. I don't know who anyone who's got, well, I know, I'm sure I know some folks, but who's got that kind of money lying around. But, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's, it's not you that has to worry, but maybe it's, you know, your children, your grandchildren. That's what, you know, I, I understand the worry behind it too. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm worried about it. And that's why I want to have a conversation about it too. And like, what, what do you think? Cause I kind of got a little bit of a sense of like, it would result in more of an inflationary event. What do you think is the end game or what's, what is the worrisome scenario as it relates to the debt? Oh, I mean, the worrisome scenario is that uh, uh, is in a way also, as I see it, the kind of a helpful scenario. And the helpful scenario might be when people say, uh, could we please, instead of talking about, uh, I don't know, about uh, 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 the incapacity of one party versus the other, and we can agree they're both uh, wanting, if we can agree, uh, agree to put aside petty things and to talk about um, uh, the nature of our public finances, both the nature of the dollar and the rate of rise in the public debt and in the relationship between the citizen on the one hand um, and, uh, and the government on the other. What, you know, we this word entitlement when, when used in a public or political sense has not really, for most people, has, um, uh, has negative uh, connotations. When you say an individual is entitled, that is never a compliment. But when you say a society is entitled, that is merely a descriptor of the social contract, they say, that we have created between uh, individuals and their government. But that social contract I would say, uh, financed as it is with immaterial paper dollars, so easily materializable by our federal that contract is a is a formula for a very very worrisome financial picture. But you know, I I, I have a feeling that uh, people might now be 
uh, a little bit losing patience with these generalities and with the spinning out of necessarily um, imprecise or, or fanciful, fancied timelines of trouble. Um, uh, I, and I, I say this, Julia, just because I want to, I don't want to seem as if I am, uh, you know, uh, pronouncing a death sentence over uh, the American fisc or the American uh, monetary situation. I think they are troubled, these two things. And I think that the uh, the very essence of a paper money system is is that it facilitates, indeed encourages, uh, the accumulation of in indebtedness, both in the public and the private sphere, as to uh, as to destabilize and at length to cripple uh, the economy in which this debt is is growing. So I uh, so anyway I I'm. We, those, we all have to do business and live our lives in this system. It's a system we have, and, and, and it has, and it is a system that is, uh, to see the thing through the fat end of the telescope, it's a system that has uh, made uh, this particular society richer than any preceding society, wealth not being everything we live for, of course, that being, of course, but um, so, so it's, it's great. It's worrying, all those things at once. Uh, but within this system, we have to make our lives. We can't uh, evidently reform it tomorrow. So the question is, how do we proceed with things as they are rather than uh, bewail things as they might have been had we not taken wrong turns at certain junctures in the past? That makes sense. Let me ask one follow on too. Um, because I've had a lot of conversations on this podcast about the outlook as it relates to the U.S. dollar and its supremacy. Um, I guess we've seen over the course of history um, the rise and fall of currencies. What is more of your outlook on the U.S. dollar? And um, I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah. Well, the, you know they they say is the, the the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry, which is. Uh, I guess encouraging. <laughs> if you don't, um, uh, if you don't uh, mark the uh, uh, somewhat uh, unflattering nature of that uh, of that praise, um, the thing the you mentioned, Julia, that there is a uh, a long uh, the kind of secular rhythm to the rise and fall of nations and of their currencies and. Uh, um, uh, the dollar is rather a newcomer on the stage of dominant world currencies, or we say uh, um, uh, is the uh, uh, is the uh, the I don't know what, what's I'm I'm losing the 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 uh, the um, uh, the standard cliche. The dollar is the reserve. Uh, yes, the dollar is the world's reserve currency, as the uh, the pound sterling was before. I would say that the um, that the institution of the world reserve currency is rather a poisoned chalice. It's not something that you want. It is something that is pleasurable uh, for a time, but it's 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 uh, it's more to be hoped for uh, than to attained. And I say this because the a reserve currency privilege gives you uh, the opportunity. Some would say the duty to consume more than you produce. People will say that um, uh, because we own this franchise, that we are, you know, the world's leading power, that we are the world's leading economy. Therefore, we are the world's um, dominant currency. We are the exchange. We are the currency in which invoices are drawn up. We are the currency in which dollars and which wealth is accumulated by foreign central banks and uh, and treasuries department exchequers. So it all comes to the territory, but I, I, I don't think that's true. I, I, I don't believe that it is either desirable or necessary uh, that because the United States is the issuer of the world's uh, reserve currency that we must uh, do these things. We must uh, consume 
to excess more than we produce, we must export jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say that it's better if we lost this franchise, which I dare say in time, again, it's a truism in a time, uh, we will lose it. Something to mark about the, the nature of monetary dominance in the world is that it is a very long-lived, um, a very long-lived institution is this dominance. Uh, the British uh, pound sterling was dominant throughout the 19th century, uh, up until 1914, certainly. But after uh, the visible and uh, clear decline of British power after 1918, uh, 1919, after, after that, the, the, the pound uh, retained much of its centrality. Indeed, it was... Uh, um, the reserve currency of the um, of the British Commonwealth through the 1950s. So, so uh, these these changes. You you read thing you know things about Bretton Woods too about uh, as they call it, about, about the about the um, uh, the developing power of countries like Iran and China and Russia. Not very. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be a part of that uh, to create alternatives to the dollar. But my I guess my my money, as it were, is on the dollar for retaining this dubious privilege of the um, of the world's uh, dominant currency. For uh, uh, have you ever heard this expression for the foreseeable future? Never say it. <laughs> <'Cause> okay. <laughs> there, no, you know what's foreseeable? Like uh, five minutes. From, so nothing's foreseeable, <laughs> uh, certainly in this life. But uh, for I, I think the other things being the same, this this reserve currency uh, curse, yeah, curse, is ours. And uh, so, uh, what does that mean? So, uh, you know, with uh, within the context of owning the reserve currency privilege, the dollar has uh, been up and down. It has uh, had bull markets and bear markets. Now it is rather on a roll. The world is convinced that the Fed will lead the world in high interest rates indefinitely and that um, in search of yields heretofore unavailable world, uh, countries will flock to our currency and bid up the exchange rate and et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, I don't have a, I don't have a strong opinion on it. Um, I observe the arguments and uh, um, I find, Julia, by the way, that um, as the birthday candles accumulate, I become less and less dogmatic about things that I can't possibly know. You should have interviewed me about 40 years ago. I knew everything. Was... <laughs> I wasn't born then. <laughs> oh, I, I should have said 20 years ago <laughs> yeah. when, you, when, you were in, when you were in grade school. Yeah, not sure I understand, but um, okay. Uh, one more following. Do you, do you like gold? Oh, yes. Can you yes. explain your thoughts there? Uh, yeah. I'm, um. Well, gold is a uh, is a monetary asset. It's easy on the eyes, Julia. Yeah. It is uh, got all these wonderful physical uh, uh, characteristics. You know, it is ductile. It is you can take a little bit of it and pound out a, a wafer a thin sheet that will astonish you by its dimensions. And it is. Uh, it is accepted as a monetary asset the world over at sight. And uh, because it is something tangible, you don't have to have a, a working electrical outlet to get at it as you might with certain cryptocurrencies. <laughs> so it's a nice thing in that respect. Um, but to me, it is money. I, I'm not sure, I, I, I suspect that this is partly an age thing. I, I, um, I can't help but notice, and I find it rather downcasting that uh, I don't mean to single you out, Julia, but people oh, of your, <laughs> yeah. your age don't seem to mind that uh, they go out and buy Dogecoin, a dog coin that uh, mm -hmm. they can't see it. Um, but to me, a part of the charm of money, you know, it's a Scrooge McDuck idea. You want to have a, a vault full of this stuff to roll around in during your old age if your arthritic body will allow you to do it. I so love I, it. <laughs> I, so I, I think that, uh, that gold is money. And I think that as money, it competes with uh, fiat money, which can be and is materialized uh, uh, at quite a right, or at quite a rate. And as money, it also competes with credit, which is the promise to pay money. So gold is 
is is is a competing asset against interest bearing uh, uh, obligations such as bonds and dividend paying stocks. It competes against them, and it competes against uh, dollar bills. Now, uh, gold, of course, pays no interest in that sense. It's sterile, it's, uh, um, but its very sterility. Um, is uh, part and parcel of its uh, its appeal because it has no credit risk attaches to it. Yeah. So if you want a uh, a safe haven from this tumultuous world of desperate debts and of cocksure central bankers who uh, do the most extraordinary things, Julia, with you have you have no idea what they do with, with dollar bill. They profusion with which they create them is just remarkable yeah That's, yeah so i so you asked me about 15 minutes ago whether i like gold yeah you love it <laughs> i got it um it is well i this came up on the show too recently um it was like a bunch of central banks have been buying gold in record quantities what do you make True. of that yeah well it's the, it's the uh it's the most intelligent thing they've done in generations <laughs> Um, I, oh, I, I, you know, they, they, I think realize that, uh, uh, that, uh, gold is a singular, uh, monetary asset and you don't have to be on the good side of the Biden administration to cash it in. Now the United States has become rather high handed in its international monetary relations. It seems to me it is Switzerland was on the, on, on the, uh, news ticker today, the very day that we're speaking, Julia, and Switzerland said it would not um, seize and sequester uh, Russian assets because it regarded that as a violation of the norms of international law and of international uh, uh, financial standards. And the United States has, has not been so punctilious. We have been rather high-handed, whether it's Iran back in the 70s or, or lots of other countries where we, we have uh, not been averse to throwing around our weight at ordering people uh, to mind their P's and Q's with respect to terrorists and customers. So um, uh, you don't have to be an American citizen to be under the rule and the shadow and indeed sometimes the thumb of American law and regulation. And I have no doubt, but there is a, um, a welling resentment against this on the part of other sovereign states. And I think part of that um, goes to uh, part of the accumulation by central banks of gold bullion uh, owes to that uh, high handedness. Yeah. Um, I have some viewer questions that I want to get to as well. And one of the viewers um, asks about the Federal Reserve and their rate hikes. And if you think that it will be higher for longer. And the follow-on to it is what could possibly break to get the Fed to pause? Yeah, great questions. Um, I thought uh, the Fed would be uh, uh, much less willful, much less determined in its in anti-inflation stance. And uh, I now re see with uh, some, um, some, uh, little regret that I had great amount of company in that view. We, you know, the the, uh, the Fed had uh, uh, had laid it down that uh, if the stock market, uh, lay, I say lay it down, had let it be known. We had come to see that if the stock market was down by 15%. Fed would suddenly get a little wobbly in the knees, knees excuse me, knees, and would uh, uh, would relent on its tightening campaign if it were tightening. That had been demonstrated. For many years, and uh, uh, but the Fed, I think, was properly appalled, mortified, and embarrassed at its failures in 2020 and 21. We tend to forget; the Fed wants us to forget that in those two years, 2020, 21, Fed came out and said that we are going to implement a regime of average inflation targeting. If inflation runs under our target, we are going to let it run higher just so we can average it out to 2% plus. Huh? But they, you know, Jay Powell himself said that. I guess he said it at um, Jackson Hole, one of his speeches. 
And the Fed said at one point, we said, we are not going to tighten in anticipation of higher inflation. We're going to wait until we see the whites of the eyes of higher inflation. And then, Julia, when the Fed saw the whites of the eyes of higher inflation, it didn't tighten because it predicted that inflation would be transitory. Ah. So it was wrong, 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 R-O-N-G, wrong. It was wrong about 2007, too, or 2006, 2007. We had no idea what was happening to it then. I had no idea that there was inflation. I mean, it has given the most extraordinary demonstrations of ineptness. However, it is not incapable of, uh, of embarrassment nor is J. Powell incapable of a determination not to go down in history as another Arthur Burns, who was the anti-hero of the inflation of the early 70s. So, okay, that's part one, windy part one, answer to the very good question. So what would change things now? Well, I think the Fed would uh, retreat in the following circumstances, if it could with dignity, if not with analytical uh, clarity, if it could declare victory at say a 3% rate of rise in inflation, and if, if that moment coincide with trouble in the stock market or the bond market or the economy or in the labor market, it would, with relief, uh, pull back and get back into the business of creating credit. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the thing, so when would that happen? Who knows? I would have thought it might have happened by now. Um, uh, very, very low interest rates, which have been on offer since 2000 and called 2010-11. I mean, 0% rates have been in decade, zero or near zero rates have been forced for 10 years, had been forced for 10 years, uh, had, uh, had uh, pushed people into taking great risk with reaching for yield. It had incited private equity promoters to borrow a lot of money with which to buy companies and lever them up. It had... Uh, emboldened the Congress to lay on a bunch of public debt and run a lot of deep deficits. So all of this has left its trail in, in financial fragility, to use that phrase that Hyman Minsky made famous. So the, so, the, so, the, the, so the system, the structure of finance, I would say is rather fragile owing to uh, high levels of leverage we see in balance sheets, both public and private. So, uh, so in further answer or attempted answer to this very good question of so many minutes ago, what we have now is the following constellation of factors that are working to tighten our financial conditions. One is a, is a really dramatic decline in the rate of expansion of the money supply. Money supply growth was powering ahead at 20% a year or something during the, and more during the pandemic and its immediate uh, wake. And now the money supply is actually, by many measures, contracting. Now, um, Ludwig von Mises, kind of the, uh, uh, the founding spirit of uh, the Austrian approach to economic analysis uh, says that, uh, uh, that the boom stops uh, when the rate of growth of money and credit stops. The, 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 the boom requires um, uh, ever stronger doses of monetary stimulus to sustain it. Well, that, that the, the sustaining infusions of money and credit have, have by and large subsided. So that's, that's one problem on the horizon for the Fed to consider. And the Fed was willfully oblivious to money supply excesses on the upside. But when they occurred, Jay Powell said, we have to unlearn lessons of the money supply. Uh, and the Fed is just as I think blind, willfully blind to the, de the radical deceleration in monetary growth of the present. Something else that has happened that is out there and unarguable 
is that uh, short term yields are much higher than longer term yields. That's called an inverted yield curve. And from time out of mind, that has been um, uh, a, a, a fact that has, um, uh, that has uh, 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 penalized credit creation. You know, banks borrow short, they raise short-term deposits, and with those funds, they, they lend for longer terms. But if the rate they pay on deposits is higher than the rate they can achieve with buying securities or lending to businesses, um, they will stop creating credit. So that's something else that's going on. So the yield curve is negative, monetary growth is negative, and short-term interest rates have spiked at a, at a, at a very, ex, at a, like it's a car that goes from zero to 60 in only a few seconds, a, a, a real, really uh, moonshot higher in, um, in, in short-term money rates. So uh, these, these, these things all conspire, I think, uh, uh, to tighten our monetary conditions. Eventually, these tighter conditions, I think, will make themselves felt not in a good way in the financial markets, liquidity tightens. In, when liquidity eases, uh, everyone's happy. When it tightens, uh, the opposite. So that's that's something we're looking for. I mean, I th so our, we've we've boiled us down to a, a couple of headlines. We think there's that inflation is for the long term. We think that this is inherently an inflationary setup we have with runaway public borrowing and with uh, an unchecked and undisciplined engine of credit creation, the Fed. So inflation for the long run. But for the short term, we think that things are rather disinflationary, meaning the rate of rise in inflation is going to subside and uh, conditions will tighten for the financial markets. Um, you know, this, but let me, let me uh, add one codicil to this windy. Um, oh, I love uh, it. Keep going. Uh, it's great. Yeah. Um, th and that is that, that there's, Inflation is never transitory, at least not in the modern era, because prices never come down again. When they go up, they stay up. So um, uh, a very fast rate of rise can be transitory. That can be that can come off to nine percent. Is going to not can be nine percent. It's going to be six percent or five percent. But but we think. But the prices of things you buy are not really going to come down. If you look at a long-term chart of the CPI, don't look at the rate of change in the CPI, just look at the level of the index. It never comes down. At least it hasn't in modern times. So that's money that's purchasing power is lost forever. And that money, that purchasing power that people have worked for, those heartbeats that people have invested in creating the income from which they have saved, that wealth, that savings, that those investments, that the purchasing power of those dollars is lost. So that is that's a that's a political question. I dare say it's a moral question. Uh, so all this chatter about uh, people people are preoccupied. I think much more than they should be with the rate of change in inflation. It's inflation, and 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 the money you lose, whether it's two percent or two percent, is better than nine percent as a rate of rise in inflation. But the, the trend is towards loss of purchasing power. Yeah. Um, again, the way you explain things, it's so incredible and it's so helpful and pages and pages of notes. I want to do a quick follow on because you did mention the inverted yield curve and um, one of the consequences being uh, banks stop creating that credit. One of the viewers had a question for you about the yield curve, and they wanted to know how steep do you think the yield curve will get, the two and the 10 spread, and does it still predict a recession? Well, the 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 record, the track record and the lore of an inverted yield curve goes, goes back to the, um, I guess, the 60s, 1960s. Uh, an academic whose name I have forgotten, I think now with Duke University, um, observe that uh, without fail, when the yield curve, you can define it in different ways. I'll get around to that in a second. But when short rates um, uh, protrude over long rates, that um, uh, that uh, foretells a recession within you know, a reasonable time, a year, year and a half. And uh, he says that uh, uh, eight sightings 
eight affirmations of the theory. Eight for eight. Never fails. Well, I am never so sure about that. I mean, I, I think that if things were uh, that uh, cocksure that uh, life would be simpler, I, I think life would remain complex. I think there is a tendency uh, to recession that has been um, uh, validated in modern times for eight consecutive periods, and perhaps it will be now. I think, by the way, I think the the proper, to me, the the better way to measure the yield curve is by a three-month treasury bill rate, the shorter end, or the federal funds rate versus, say, a 10-year. What you want to do is, is to get the very short end where banks do much of their funding. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, 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 the on form, uh, there's a recession coming. On form, uh, a money supply, rate of growth in money supply um, uh, decelerating as fast as this rate is decelerating. That also is a bearish omen. So I think those, those I think both money supply and the yield curve are, are, are signs that we ought to take or ought to reckon with. They're important. Um, uh, amber signals. Yeah. Another question that came in from a viewer, um, this person, and I believe they work in finance too, but he would like to know. Oh, a ringer. Uh -oh. I, I think he, I think he does, uh, based on his title. I don't know. I have to look it up. Um, he wants to know, and I know who it is who asked, he wants to know, what would you say to a 42 year bond veteran who has only seen an interest rate conundrum like this in the textbooks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that speaks to the very peculiar and intriguing side of the bond market that um, uh, I've never, uh, I never, I never found a good explanation of why this is so. But here is the, here is the evidence or the observation. So uh, uh, it has been true since the uh, last generation of the 1800s, that's 1870 or so to the present, uh, that interest rates rise and fall in, in decades long intervals. And um, so they, they fell from say the end of the civil war or aftermath to 1900, they rose from 1900, 1920. They fell from 1920 to 1946. And they rose for the next 35 years, 1946 to 1981. And by 1981, uh, the long dated treasury that is now not even 4% was then 15% for a nonce in 1981, towards end of September 1981. Uh, so that 35 years, people, people who had grown up in that 35 year period, 1946 to 81, had never seen interest rates fall. And um, uh, I was, I, I was, uh, I happened to be 108 years old and I lived through that. And, um, but I, um, I remember as if it were yesterday, which it kind of was in some ways, but, um, oh, here's a, here's a, a little sighting from that era. So let's go, let's, let's, let's go a little beyond 1981. So 1981 interest rates peak. And we can see that now. It wasn't quite so clear then. It was almost clear, but it wasn't quite definitive. But uh, you know, Reagan is in the White House, and uh, deregulation is going on. And, uh, commodity prices, come down. And the air controllers uh, went on strike in 1981, I guess, and and Reagan broke that strike. And everything seemed to point to a time of of much much lower inflation. Indeed, times of uh, of sweet stability, um, and uh, but lo and behold, something untoward and unscripted happened. And that is that rates began to go up again, bond yields. And in 1984, in the spring of 84, the long dated treasury, 30 year treasury got to 14% when inflation was running at four or thereabouts. So you had 10 percentage points of real, can you imagine this? Talk about heaven for a creditor. And you could, and some visionaries did, buy zero coupon bonds that had no reinvestment risk. You could buy them like 
like eighteen dollars, and they would mature in thirty years at a thousand. How's that for you know better than the stock? Oh God! Uh, did I buy that? No, Julia, I did not buy that. <laughs> but that so so but but I'm just this is to your friend's question. Now that you've been out of the to use your friend, <laughs> your friend. So, so, so people have been so can, but, but this is, speaks to the power of, of, of muscle memory, right? Or, or, or conditioning. Um, so people had had 35 or more years of conditioning that rates only go up, bond yields only go up, inflation is endemic, <clears throat> systemic, systemic. Um, and uh, this, oh, the word was structural, the word was structural. So you really can't get rid of it. And some of the brightest lights on Wall Street said that. Um, Milton Friedman uh, was on the wrong side of this particular trade. Um, so, so that was then, that's the present. So <clears throat> interest rates peaked in 1981, and they bottomed, let us say, in 2020. So the 10-year was less than one half of 1% or something. Extraordinary. From Call it from 14% to one half of 1% over the course of those 40 years. Uh, about 40 years. Um, my goodness. So what is the expectation of people now? People expect that rates will go right back down again because that is all that people, mostly people whose fears have been in finance, that's all they've seen. Literally, you have to have, you have to have a very long career to have seen anything but. So um, I would say that uh, to answer to this great question is you have to um, keep an open mind and and uh, keep reminding yourself that the uh, you know, past is not necessarily prologue. Uh, it is um, sometimes very uh, infrequently in the bond market, you have to uh, put aside all memory and uh, and open your mind to the possibility of something very new and very different and not always agreeable. And and I was slow to let go of the idea in the early 80s that this was a, a great new era for financial assets, but so it proved to be. It was a marvelous thing. 40, can, you imagine, can you imagine 40 years of falling interest rates and mostly um, benign stock markets indeed, a, a pretty persistent um, increase in price earnings multiples that part, was part and parcel of the decline in rates. So it might be that um, that them was the good old days. The good old days, yeah, indeed. I'm gonna try to okay. I'm gonna try to get one more viewer question in, and if you'll um, allow me to ask one of my own, I don't know if you have to run. Do you have enough time? I am. I'm running out of answers, but I'll do two more. One okay. from you and one from a viewer. Okay. We'll I, do. Really we'll do the short. viewer, and then I'll okay. get the last one. Okay. Okay. So um, this viewer, they read your book, uh, "The Forgotten oh. Depression, 1921: oh, okay. The Crash That Cured Itself." I know you have many books, um, and I guess a little a context. Uh, it was regarding um, that deflationary bout following the Spanish flu pandemic and the return to normal post-war. I did the audiobook version of this a couple of years ago, but their question for you, Jim, is how is this period similar and different um, than, uh, than from a monetary and fiscal standpoint? Yeah. Well, um, briefly, what happened after the uh, deflation and depression of 1920-21 that followed the inflation of uh, of World War One and its aftermath. So there was inflation, and then, as so often the case, a deflation uh, followed under the gold standard. So the United States was then on a gold dollar, and so inflation was uh, terrible. Deflation was scary. The unemployment rate got to they didn't measure it then. It was before uh, the battery of macroeconomic data with which we preoccupy ourselves now, but unemployment must have been in the teens. Certainly the stock market was sawed in half, commodity prices ditto, farmers suffered, blah, 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 onward, lots of trouble. The way the government met this uh, veil of tears was to balance the budget and to um, raise interest rates. That raised, uh, the Fed raised interest rates to uh, protect American uh, gold, make it sure that foreigners were had uh, plenty of incentive to keep their money in this country. And uh, the result was a depression that lasted for a year and a half. But 
it uh, was kind of self-curing because the markets cleared at lower levels of prices and uh, people went back to work and foreigners seeing the great opportunities on offer in this country sent their money here, uh, thereby uh, uh, reinvigorating our commerce and refilling the money supply. This doesn't do justice to all the nuances of the period, but that's the broad outline. And the paradox was that uh, uh, by implementing the kind of the old time religion of a balanced budget and of monetary discipline, uh, that depression, virulent as it was, was cut short. Now, people in 1930 said to themselves, um, some of them said, uh, thank goodness this depression, they said, as it was just starting, is not so serious as the one of 1920, 21. But uh, in contrast, in the later depression, uh, Hoover and Roosevelt did a lot of intervention and, and only succeeded in, uh, in drawing out the, uh, the agony. Anyway, so that's, that's the short of it, the very short of it. Yeah, a lot of lessons there. I recommend folks uh, pick up a copy. Um, oh, they, it's, yes, it's, it's a really good read. <laughs> yeah, it's a must read. Um, I'm telling you, I did the audio book, um, which uh, that's how I consume my, my books. I want to ask you, Grant, um, or Jim, sorry, I'm calling you by your last name. I want to ask you, Jim, about Grant's interest rate observer. You were a journalist, um, you're working in financial media, and you started this in 1983, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong which is, it's grown into, the, it is a must read on Wall Street. I've only been in this business since, call it, 2010, but I have heard folks talk about Grant's interest rate observer. I've had copies of it. I covet, I covet copies of it. I just want to hear maybe if we could go back to that time in your life and setting it up. And if you have any lessons from that time period, and I'm kind of selfishly asking because I left the financial media world to build this podcast and have amazing conversations with folks like yourself and help folks uh, learn along the way. So uh -huh. I kind of wanted to see if you have any lessons from setting up shop in 1983 on yeah. your own? Well, one is uh, to marry Patricia Kavanaugh, former Patricia Kavanaugh, who would not let me quit when, uh, uh, see, we didn't make money the first year, didn't make money the second year, didn't make money the third year. <laughs> Darling, this will get better soon. <laughs> so uh, persistence is one lesson. I, I dare say that persistence is not helpful if it's not going to work ever. Uh, but um, uh, don't expect something new and trouble and uh, and difficult necessarily to pay off instantly is one lesson. I am still a financial journalist. I, I, I'm basically a newspaper stiff who writes about uh, about money and markets and who writes books on the side. So I've, journalism is still my craft, my trade. And uh, this is now year fifty of that. Uh, uh, of that uh, life, and uh, I would recommend it to uh, not everybody because I don't want any more competition, Julia. But uh, <laughs> it's been good to me. <laughs> so we we are now in our fortieth year, and very grateful to be. I love it. Well, those are some great lessons, and especially uh, when you mentioned like choosing your life partner. Um, I I also feel very blessed that I have a very supportive partner as well, and um, persistence and. Um, you know, recognizing if it's not going to work, but of course it's, it certainly worked out for you. I, I'm definitely not a competitor to you, but um, I do, you know, I see like how the audience reacts to the show when I put it out and it gives me like a lot of hope that I'm providing some sort of value and I, I, I enjoy it. And um, it's really a, la a labor of love. So hopefully I can make it long-term, but gosh, I gotta I... say, Jim. I would bet on it, Julia. Thank you. I have to say it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. I would love to get you back on in the future because wow, I learned a lot. So I just want to say thank you so much just for, you know, taking the time and being so generous with your thoughts and your ideas. And I do want to give you an, another like 60 seconds. If you want to let folks know where they can go um, find you or um, subscribe to the interest rate observer, please go ahead and do so. Oh, I, um, uh, we're on the, on the world wide web just uh, after, uh, uh, Grant's tomb, I think, is where we're, is Moody is, says Google has slotted us. But if you uh, ask Mr. Google for Grant's interest rate observer, I, I, I think that they'll lead you right to our door and uh, we would welcome you as a subscriber. It's I a, love it. It's a, um, 
a little bit uh, more than the uh, Wall Street Journal and a little bit less than a cable subscription. I love it. Well, I think it's a great deal. Jim Grant, uh, founder and editor and publisher of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. Thank you so much. It was oh, so much welcome, fun having Julia. you on. Thank it you, Jim. Was, it was delight. Thank you, Julia. Hey, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that video. Be sure to hit that like button, the subscribe and that bell so you won't miss any new videos.